Good afternoon and welcome to the first webinar and virtual roundtable of the Medicines Patent Pool <clears throat> on scaling up access to enteroretroviral therapy just prior to the 23rd International AIDS Conference that starts next week. My name is Marie Polkini and I'm the chair of the MPP board and I will be your moderator today. This July, the Medicines Patent Pool is turning 10 and it is with great pride that I share that in the 10 years of life that MPP has been operating, we have enabled delivery of over 12 billion doses of treatment. Today, MPP holds 10 license agreements with 22 generic manufacturers and 131 countries have benefited from access to MPP licensed products in HIV, hepatitis C and tuberculosis. One such product that is saving millions of lives is Dolutegravir or DTG. Since the Welfare Organization recommended DTG as part of its first line treatment for people living with HIV in 2019, the global transition towards combination regimen containing DTG has accelerated. Today, millions across the globe have initiated or switch to affordable quality version of this new regimen that is easier to adhere to and better tolerated by patients. This rapid scale up has required a partnership approach that involves communities, governments, industry, and the global health community to work together. Much can be learned from this experience. In today's part panel discussion, we will bring together many of these partners who have been critical to MPP's antiretroviral scale-up journey. Over the next hour, we will have two questions for each of our esteemed panelists. One about reflections on DTG and the other on how the antiretroviral story can shape our fight against COVID-19, where we must not leave anyone behind for diagnostics, treatment or vaccines. So joining me today is Nelson Otwama, the Executive Director of the National Empowerment Network of People Living with HIV AIDS in Kenya, Carmen Perez Casas, Senior Strategy Manager at UNITAID, Helen McDowell, Head of Government Affairs and Global Public Health at Viv Healthcare, Anil Soni, Head of Global Infectious Diseases at Milan, Tada, <coughs> sorry, Tadana Hamisi Mengezi, Pharmaceutical Supply Chain and Logistic Officer in the Department of HIV and AIDS at the Ministry of Health of Malawi, Jürgen Pile, Country Director for South Africa at Clinton Health Access Initiative, and finally, Esteban Burone, Head of Policy and Advocacy at the Medicines Patent Pool. Now, let's get started. To set the stage, I first invite Esteban Burone, Head of Policy at MPP, to share data on impact to date and on the progress made in scaling up DTG. Hello, hello, Mary Paul. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to, um, to talk to you today. Um, the objective of this presentation is to present data on the up uptake of uh, WHO's recommended first line HIV treatment in, in low and middle income countries. And this data is um, data that we receive on a quarterly basis from um, the licensees of the medicines patent pool and gives us really a unique insight on what's happening with the rolling out and, 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 and scaling up of the use of the, <clears throat> the transitioning towards this new um, first line regimen. But before doing so, I do want to stress one point. The data we are showing today is up to March 2020. Now, in any other context, this would be considered very recent data and likely a very accurate picture of what the situation is today. However, as you all know, March 2020 does coincide with the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, related confinement and lockdowns in many countries. So um, this may, as a result, not necessarily represent what the reality is today. And as you as many of you probably have been reading over the last couple of days <clears throat> or the last week or so reports coming out of the Global Fund um, and, and UNAIDS and, and really getting a sense of the extent to which there may be massive disruptions in HIV services. 
So I wanted to start off by simply mentioning that because what we're showing you here is <clears throat> data, very exciting um, transitioning towards first line, but at the same time, uh, we, we, there's a massive question that would be interesting to hear from, from our colleagues from the ground on what's happening um, <clears throat> with, um, with, in the context of COVID-19. So most of you would be aware of, the, of who the MPP is and, and what we do, but just to remind ourselves, <clears throat> our mission is to increase access to and facilitate the development of life-saving medicines for low and middle income countries. And we do this through a voluntary licensing mechanism and patent pooling. And we do this partnering very closely with the pharmaceutical industry that often holds the key patents on um, important new medicines, um, taking licenses and then partnering with the uh, uh, generic manufacturers that are going to be developing, scaling up, registering and, and making those available. In that whole process, we work very closely with civil society, communities, governments, agencies, etc. Now, in the timeline for 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 um, uh, for um, the Dolotegravir is, is is really uh, spelled out in this in this slide, and I'm not going to go through all the detailed steps of it. But uh, just to say, Vive Healthcare developed this drug uh, and brought it uh, and got approval back in August 2013, and by April we had established a very strong partnership that we're all very proud of that has really uh, made all of the the, the subsequent steps uh, possible. We now have multiple generic manufacturers that have brought the pro uh, product to market and that have uh, obtained uh, quality assurance uh, through the relevant regulatory authorities and that are now supplying a large number of countries. And most recently this year, uh, we see now that pediatric, new pediatric formulations are also being developed uh, and rolled out. There's a data I'll be presenting to you is from uh, MPP generic licensees that you see here in this slide, and also from Orobindo, which is a, a direct licensee of, of Eve Healthcare, and that has also contributed the data to what I will be sharing with you here. <clears throat> so starting off, I'll be presenting essentially about two products, the Dolotegravir 50 milligram formulation <clears throat> and the, the combination with Tenofovir and Lamivudine TLD. Now, um, of course, both of them, uh, TLD is today the preferred first line treatment uh, uh, and second line treatment of, um, in, in, uh, by WHO. Now, um, as you can see in, the, in, in, in this slide, uh, this shows really a story about how the, the, the manufacturers have been able to develop the product, get quality assurance, and then gradually start filing and getting regulatory approval country by country, which is of course, essential in order to ensure that countries and that people in those countries eventually get access. And you see here uh, in the previous slide on Dolotegravir and in this slide on TLD. So it's a gradual process. Uh, this has been moving and moving very fast. Uh, and every year, you know, the ones that appear in green are new ones that have appeared in the last quarter. So every quarter, there's a, there's a range of additional countries that are now able to, to also access. Now, um, just to show you the, 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 how the scale-up has been happening country by, by country, this really shows you the, the, um, the story with respect to TLD and how quarter after quarter, more and more countries have been able to procure uh, TLD, the combination, uh, and, um, uh, and, and the scale-up has gradually been happening. Well, this, of course, this tells you the 75 countries that are relevant that have already uh, Obtained, uptake, uh, obtained um, uh, or procured um, TLD. Uh, in total, counting both TLD and DTG, it's a total of 103 countries that you see in this slide. So there's, there's a large number of countries and this, and this really has been, has been scaling up. Of course, in every country is a story to be told and we have some representatives that will give us a little bit of a, an overview of that story. Um, the story is one of, of, of a lot of, uh, of partners working governments, uh, civil society groups advocating and demanding access um, programs and, 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 and treatment programs and, and, and a whole range of different people playing an, an incredible role to, to, to make this all uh, possible. Now in terms of the numbers, how, how, how many people have been uh, getting access? And this gives you a very uh, a brief uh, summary of, the, of how the evolution has been since the beginning of 2018 when the first procurements really started. And you see there's been quite a jump over the last two quarters in Q4 2019 and Q1 uh, 2020. Now, I do want to remind you all that this is a story about the supply side. What this is telling you is how 
more and more um, TLD has been supplied. What it's not telling you, and that we hope to hear from, from colleagues, is what's happening on the demand side. How is that, are these pills actually reaching the people who need them? And that's, of course, remains uh, ultimately the most important point. Um, and in my last slide, really, to show you a little bit the volumes by countries, where, of course, there is, uh, unsurprisingly, a lot of concentration around some of the high burden countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then, but a number of other countries in other regions that have also made quite a significant transition. Ukraine uh, comes to mind, Haiti, Venezuela, et cetera, countries that have been also uh, procuring significant uh, amount of, of TLD over the last uh, two years. Um, so just reminding ourselves, this is all the work of the MPP and HIV is funded by UNITE. And, and I look forward to engaging with the, with the panel in, in the discussion as we move forward. Thank you very much, uh, Marie Paul and over to you. Thank you very much, Esteban. The data is indeed impressive. We can see that countries are working hard to introduce and use DTG as, as for the benefit of patients, and the quality of affordability make it really the treatment of choice. I now turn towards the panelists. So my first question goes to civil society and community perspective, and to Nelson Otuama, the executive director of Networks of Empowering People Living with HIV and AIDS in Kenya. Nelson, as someone living with HIV and taking dolutegravir, what is your perspective and that of others living with HIV in Kenya? How has access to generic treatment helped DTG uptake in your country? Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you to the Medicines Patent Pool for having me here. And uh, we are glad to join you despite the challenge of COVID. I think in terms of access to treatment, I'm happy to share that we know where we came from in terms of people who are taking a collection of antibiotics. Uh, we used to call them cocktail, and then now monotherapy came, and access was also really restricted for those who could afford. In Kenya, you could only go to South Africa or in the US to get medication. And that is simply because we did not have generic drugs. We had access only to patented drugs that were very expensive in our setting and people cannot afford. Now, with Medicines Patent Pool and their partner unit, generic medicine and computation has come up and therefore there is widespread access Going to DTG, which is the current drug we have, which is the best, well tolerated, and also with the less side effects, DTG has made access very easy in terms of affordability and also in terms of use, because it is one pill daily use and therefore promoting even adherence. It is something that is easy to administer and, and, and also easy to take, and because it is small, and uh, it is easy to consume. So in my country, Kenya, I I think I'm um, just Absolutely. concluding by saying that the coming of um, Dolutegravir has been appreciated by communities and many people living with HIV in Kenya because it is well tolerated, it is one pill daily, and therefore it, uh, adherence has even improved. And it is something that we believe Medicines Patent Pool and their partners can expand and make better even with the new upcoming uh, medicines. And we are able to access this because there's a generic version that is available that is widely accessible to communities. Uh, if it remain, remained in its original patented form, we were not going to afford it. And we also know that a time between when originally patented drugs come and reach African countries like in Kenya takes much longer time. And the role of groups like Medicines Patent Pool is that that time has now been shortened because when the discussion started about DTG at the global level and the time in which now Kenyans can access this drug, that has been shortened because of the medicines patent pool talking to pharmaceutical companies so that this drug becomes widely available. With this, I think the majority of Kenyans are now on treatment and are hearing well, and this is the best way to deliver on the last 90, which is to ensure that they sustain uh, viral suppression among people living with HIV. Thank you very much. I'm happy to add later on if there's time. Thanks a lot, Nelson. This is really a testimony to the success of communities in, in Kenya. Let me now turn uh, to UNITE. Carmen Perez-Casas, Senior Manager, 
strategy manager, Unitaid. Unitaid brings innovation faster to those who need it. In the HIV space, what has been Unitaid's role in access to HIV treatment and your effort in particular about uh, dolutegavir? What role do you think MPP has been able to play in access of dolutegavir? Thank you for the question and thank you for the invitation. Um, so yes, Unitaid is supporting ERT optimization since it was created. And as you know, we aim to transform the markets to ensure that the new, better products can be scaled up without delay. Dolutegravir is indeed a good case to explain the work in antiretrovirals in this holistic approach with so many partners. And I think despite the challenges we have encountered all of us on the way, we can talk about the story of success through collaboration. I'm gonna quickly try to look a bit back in time and among the different elements that drive a healthy market, intellectual property was the fastest to move, as we saw earlier in Esteban's presentation. The MPP and BIF announcing the licensing agreements early in 2014, just two months after EMEA approval of the originator product, was indeed a record time that enabled all of us to be here where we are today. But back in 2015 at Unitaid, we realized that other gaps persisted in the goal to render improved antiretroviral with dolutegravir available in low middle income countries. And our board agreed then with us, taking the risk and working in parallel in the market and in the science at the same time. And planning the investments simultaneously to overcome all barriers was the only way that was identified to avoid the traditional time lag for the new medicines to reach low and middle income countries, which is up to 10 years in the absence of interventions. So on the science, and despite the known advantages of dolutegravir, back in 2015, there was no data available to sustain the adoption of this product in low and middle income countries, where there is high prevalence of women living with HIV, people co-infected with tuberculosis, etc. They were rep underrepresented in the registrational trials of dolutegravir, where for example, only 9% of the study's participants were black women, where they represent the majority of the global epidemic. So we have supported up to five studies on dolutegravir in real life conditions in Africa and in other countries, which have enabled uh, WHO and countries to issue the necessary guidance. And coming back to the market, also in back in 2015, Dolutegravir was only available in a handful of countries, middle income countries and high income, and at high prices. So in parallel to that collection of evidence, a number of initiatives which I were started to complement the work that MPP had started. And furthermore, and thanks to the licenses as well on MPP to the other components of the preferred first line regime, the tenofovir, TDF, the fist dose combination, the one tablet containing the full regime TLD, was developed by generic companies. This, together with the early catalytic procurement of Unitate and Chai and the ceiling price achieved with partners, enabled this rapid global shift to TLD that Esteban was describing before. I want to highlight that very importantly, communities have been central to both the science through the trials as well as the market initiatives as critical stakeholders on the global and national decision making. And we have all learned a lot in this process. Finally, also it's very important to highlight that the investments uh, are also targeting pediatric uh, treatments. And within CHAI program, we have implemented this incentive through which two generic firms, as you will hear later, have now been able to fill already for the adapted formulations for kids in a novel strategy in collaboration with the originator, BIF and the FDA, to allow parallel filing and hence shortening the time for the pediatric formulation to reach the market by at least two years. What next, looking forward, and in view of the stubborn high levels of circulating virus at population level, our latest addition in this portfolio from Unitaid is a development project of the long-acting injectable version of TLD, including support from Medicines Patent Pool in terms of future access to these long-acting technologies. Thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, Carmen. I now turn to Viv Healthcare, to Helen McDowell, the Head of Government Affairs and Global Public Health. Viv is one of the six originators who have licensed product to the MPP. In 2014, MPP and Viv Healthcare entered into a license agreement for dolutegravir for both adults and children. 
As you saw from the presentation, DTG is reaching far and wide, thanks to this collaboration. As an originator, and based on your experience, Helen, what are the benefits of partnership, partnering with MPP? Thanks, Mary Paul, and thank you to the MPP uh, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, important webinar today. So um, I think the data that Esteban showed really speaks for itself in terms of the importance um, and the value of the license and the partnership that Vive has with the Medicines Patent Pool. And I'd just like to draw on, obviously, I think everyone probably attending this call understands the complexity of enabling access to medicines, um, particularly for global health and in resource limited settings. And, um, and really licensing has been you know, a key element of Vive's approach for enabling broad access to dolutegravir. Um, but I would like to touch on some of the other pieces as well that we have done that I think also are important and have further helped um, the, the MPP license and our sub-licensees to achieve the rollout that we've, that we've seen to date. Um, and I think this really sort of works importantly with the partnership and how we um, work on a you know, very regular and open basis with the team at the MPP. So firstly, I think what was really important important was getting a real signal from the WHO um, after the phase three data started to become available for dolutegravir about the potential role of this product um, across uh, the HIV response in multiple lines of therapy. That gave a very strong signal and understanding of the potential demand and opportunity for this medicine and how it could impact the, 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 the response. This instigated our ability to really drive quickly the licensing agreements, both um, with the MPP and also directly with Arabindo, um, and also really fueled our very broad registration plan um, for dolutegravir. So over 130 countries um, now have a approval of Vibe's product, but importantly, those registrations were not just for the supply of Vives medicine, but they have been really important in many countries as a reference for the generics. So we have done those, those uh, files, not ever anticipating for Vives to supply medicine there, but knowing that it makes it easier for our licensees. And, and the partnership with the MPP has helped us better understand which countries um, that has, it, it is critical for. Building on some of Carmen's comments, of course, the other piece that has been really important is to continue to invest in the right research to inform the use of this product beyond the registrational studies in, real, real, in, in the real world. So it, investing in TB co-infection studies, looking at second line, and investing very early in big powered studies in pediatrics, which generally has, has never been done before with a pediatric product. So the Odyssey study, for example, which has been really important to support the pediatric development development of dolutegravir. This flexible approach to IP and the voluntary licenses has been really important. Ultimately, it's, it's achieved what we all want a voluntary license to do, which is to reduce the prices in developing countries and increasing manufacturing capacity. And the thing that's been unique with dolutegravir is a product that's used across first, second and third line means that there are huge volumes of product that are needed, which meant that we needed a quite a number of sub licensees to enable and ensure that there is enough demand there to, to meet the supply. Sorry, enough supply to meet the demand, get it the right way around. So I think that's been really important um, in that partnership. We've also used flexible pricing and local manufacturing and partnerships. I think, again, as Carmen has mentioned, and I'm sure Anil will mention later, building on the framework of those licenses has been really important to enable us to support and expedite the, the right formulations for children, which we know there are complexities in the market, but by collaboration, we can work together and really help make sure that the optimal products get to patients who need them as quickly as possible. The essence across all of these pieces is partnership and collaboration. And with uh, the Medicines Patent Pool, the partnership that we've had around Integrava, the challenges that we have worked through over the five years that we have been in this partnership have been really helpful and important for global health. And I'm sure we'll have learnings, um, both for healthcare system infrastructure, but also for COVID-19. Um, and so we, uh, you know, I think we've, we've learned a lot together on, on this journey with Dolly Tegrava, and I'm sure there is still more to come. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. So my next question is for Mylan to Anil Sony, Head of Global Infectious Diseases. 
Myland has licenses for DTG in HIV and it's also worth mentioning that, that, that Clatasvir for uh, hepatitis C. Can you tell us how you have worked with these licenses and what it has meant for you in this space? And how do you foresee the pediatric markets for these products shaping up? Anil. Sure, well, thank you very much. I uh, will answer both of those questions building on the comments that were already mentioned by uh, my colleagues, as has been consistently said, this is very much a collaboration and each of these organizations plays a unique role. Um, to be clear, in terms of the medicines patent pool's role, it, it, the MPP is providing a life-saving service. In the case of HIV and HCV, as you mentioned, remarkably effective treatments like dolutegravir and dicladosphere have been developed, but their original development and launch is typically in high-income countries. But as we know, most of the disease burden is in low- and middle-income countries, and licenses and partners who facilitate those licenses, like the MPP, bridge that gap. In certain cases, the licenses are only available through the MPP uh, when the products are protected by patents in the countries in which they need to be used or manufactured. And in those instances, as I said, the MPP is providing a life-saving service. In the case of dolutegravir, and I'll also speak to dicladosphere and a little bit to pediatrics, as has been mentioned already, um, rather than repeating the success, and there's been much success, uh, I'll try to highlight some of the areas where I think we could, in fact, do better uh, and some of the uh, progress we're making in, in fact, doing better as we move forward here in 2020. In dolutegravir, as has been mentioned, from the 2013 approval of the Eve, we had the first generic approvals of a licensed product, a bioequivalent product in 2017. Mylan was the first, and we're very much proud of that, but now there are multiple generic manufacturers who have that approval. And as a result, as we've seen, there's wide registration, more than 3 million people on TLD according to CHAI, and the numbers are just going up. The, this also allowed uh, the license for the volume guarantee uh, that was supported by Unitaid, uh, CHAI, uh, DFID, the Gates Foundation, and others, along with Aurobindo. And that uh, volume guarantee in concert with the license was unique in that it allowed us to scale up to a larger manufacturing platform than would have otherwise been possible and also to launch at a very low price even on day one. I think one of the challenges of TLD, which thankfully we're now past, is the early clinical data in pregnant women. And while we've moved past this with additional data that's been generated by the trial supported by some of the people on this call, I think it highlights one area of need or uh, for additional progress for all of us, which is that early clinical data be for the populations that will be using these products and not having the bias towards American and European populations, which has too often been the case with the development of some of these therapies. Let me say a couple of words about dicladosphere and pediatrics before moving on. On dicladosphere, Again, there's much progress in hepatitis C uh, cures that are now available, six months, low toxicity products. Dicladosphere is a, a core uh, molecule in combination with sofosbuvir for that. In the case of dicladosphere, again, four years from the approval of the originator, in that case, BMS, to when you had the approval of generics in 2019, uh, three generics approved to date by the World Health Organization with nearly a million people receiving the product through last year. So again, four years from approval of the originator to the generic approvals and then a wide scale up following that. In the case of HCV, however, a challenge to note is that the scale up um, does not include donor funding as is typical for HIV, TB, and malaria. And in part, because of the lack of donor funding, there hasn't been a corresponding lack of a consistent quality standard like WHO pre-qualification. So the HCV market, I would say, is more fragmented uh, uh, from a consistent quality standard point of view and also from the point of view of having donor funding for it. And I know that's something many of us are working on. On pediatrics, I'll focus specifically on dolutegravir, just building on what was said. I want to give Dee a lot of credit here. I think in the past, pediatrics, even though there's typically an FDA or European Medicines Agency requirement to develop pediatric formulations, there are some companies that take a more assertive, uh, aggressive, ambitious approach to that, and Deep is certainly one of them. They just received approval for a pediatric uh, dispersible formulation of dolutegravir uh, just this month. And I want to flag here a last point, which is 
this four year gap from when an originator gets approval to when a generic gets approval, I actually think is far too long. Um, in the case of COVID, if there's a new investigational agent, if it were to be four years from when there's wide scale access to a low cost generic version of that for developing countries, no one in the world, literally in the world, everyone's had by news, that would not be satisfactory. And so we need to reduce that four years to something much, much less. And on that front, I want to highlight in the case of pediatric dolutegravir, the approach VEV has taken with its licensees through the MPP and others to say, we'll give you access to our investigational product and actually move on the tech transfer before we have FDA approval. So we're not going to sequentially wait for FDA approval to then start that work. We're going to do it in parallel. And as a result, VEV now has two licensees, including Mylan, who have already submitted the pediatric product just as it's getting its approval, not six months, 12 months, 18 months later. And my hope, fingers crossed, is that within six months, you'll have pediatric generic forms of that dolutegravir. So six months as opposed to four years. And I think that points us in a direction of how we can do even better in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Really impressive. Now, um, let's turn to the country perspective with Malawi. So access and scale-up is only made possible through the commitment of the countries and their ability to include Dolitegravir in their national guidelines and bring treatment to the people who need it. So now uh, I would like to welcome Talada Hamisi from the Ministry of Health of Malawi. Malawi has acted promptly to introduce DTG into the national program. What has been Malawi's experience and how has scale-up been achieved? Thank you, Mary Paul, and thank you to the MPP for inviting Malawi to share our country perspective. Um, Malawi made the decision to switch to DTG based regimens as far back as 2017, and that's when the, the Ministry of Health worked with its other expert committees to update the HIV clinical management guidelines for children and adults. And uh, these guidelines were ready by 2018. At the same time, there was also a move to introduce pharmacovigilance into the guidelines so that we can be able to look at the adverse drug reactions and to be able to track as we're making the switch from TLE to TLD. We also, as a country, updated our training curriculum, including the TLD regimens, as well as the pharmacovigilance in there. We started training healthcare workers in 2018, and in parallel, the supply chain team proceeded to start processing orders through the Global Fund Food Procurement Mechanism. We, our plan was to have at least six months buffer stock at central level we, uh, as we distribute the TOD to the facility level. And just for information, we have about 750 health facilities countrywide that we distribute to, to the last mile. We proceeded to start distributing the TOD in December 2018. And as it was earlier mentioned, we had the issue of women not being able to transition immediately due to the Botswana study at that point in time. But we started with uh, transitioning men in January 2019. At the time that we're first processing our orders, uh, the TOD generic was at $6.25 in June 2018. And currently it's now at $5.30 for the no carton version. Uh, this is for the TOD 30s. And then it's also at $15.65 for the 90s uh, TOD version. So we would like to show how the MPP has assisted to make sure that we have access to the generic version and we're able to, to deliver free healthcare to all our clients in Malawi. And just for your information, by the time we started switching, we had about 805,000 people on TOE 600. And this is the number that we're planning to transition up to this year. Uh, we're, still in, we're still finalizing our transition and we'll have data in the near future. Currently, we receive TOD from about four manufacturers, which means that our demand is met. We have not had any problems with our supply demand situation. We haven't had any stockouts thus far. And during the time of COVID-19, we've been able to assist our clients to access six months of multi scripting for the TLD without any stockouts at central level or at facility level. 
And just to mention some of the problems that we faced were that uh, for some of the clients, we had a blind transition because we were transitioning the whole country. So by the time we started transition, uh, we had about 90% viral load suppression rate in our clients. And for these clients, we, there was a study that was done by MSF France in Chirad Zulu for a cohort, cohort of about 1,800. And there were some results that showed that as we transitioned, those who were silently failing on TOE 600 to TOG, there's been some instant mutations showing that they, they're also failing on TOD. So for us, this is a learning point. And we are trying to use the pharmacovigilance systems that we have set up with the Pharmacy Medicines Regulatory Authority to make sure that we can track uh, all these side effects as well as any other Gen uh, genotyping issues that we're having. And I think just to mention, um, when we're starting off, one interesting thing was that we had an interesting side effect, which was erectile dysfunction in clients transitioning to TOD, which we were not expecting, of course, and we reported through WHO and we continue to monitor these side effects. And we look forward to finalizing our transition in Malawi. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tawala. Let's, let's move now to country and NGO perspective. Our last panelist is Yogan Pile, no country director in South Africa with a Clinton Health Access Initiative. But until very recently, he was the Deputy Director General for the National Department of Health in South Africa. Yogan, uh, last year, South Africa launched its new guidelines for the introduction of TD uh, deritigravir. What has been the South African experience, knowing that it is the country with the largest national ART program? All right, well, thank you very much, and thanks to the MPP for this invitation. Um, uh, yes, you're correct. South Africa introduced uh, uh, TLD on the 1st of December last year. Uh, while I was the uh, Deputy Director General uh, responsible for health programs in the department, uh, my uh, approach and vision was to introduce it as early as April 2019. But of course, as a, my colleague from Malawi said, we then had uh, the neural tube defect issues uh, that we had to deal with. And we went into a very long protracted discussion, both with civil society organizations, women's groups, including women who are HIV positive, as well as our politicians to try and figure out how we deal with this. And after a very long discussion and promising the politicians that we will strengthen our pharmacovigilance and in particular, our pregnancy registries, uh, that they then gave us permission uh, to uh, go ahead and transition uh, from TE to TLD. And that's really how we landed with the transitioning as late as the 1st of December. And of course, as you know, in the South, December is uh, our summer period, so we have uh, long holidays. Uh, so the uh, uptake of TLD has been slow uh, through to the end of January, but has certainly picked up between that period and the end of April. However, uh, we've had significant and fairly hard lockdowns because of COVID and the COVID pandemic uh, since the middle of March. Uh, which has retarded the number of patients that have come to our facilities and has increased the number of uh, patients who have two or three months supply of TEE. Uh, so to date, we have an estimated about 1 million patients who have transitioned uh, or have been initiated on, on TLD. The intention is to have uh, reached about 2.7 million by December 2020. Um, there were initial uh, issues around uh, transitioning patients, both from uh, patients themselves, women especially, as well as from their clinicians, largely around the issue of contraception. Um, so, and we've had sporadic out, uh, um, we've had sporadic uh, cases of contraceptives being out of stock, uh, which has also uh, made it difficult for some women to transition uh, to, T, uh, to TLD. That, uh, that seems to have uh, been eroded. Uh, we currently do not have as much clinician or patient reluctance to transition. Uh, the advantages 
of course, we've had, which is a bit of a perverse advantage, is that we've had a shortage of TEE in the last couple of months, which has also spurred both program managers at provincial and facility level, as well as, as clinicians to transition some patients from TEE to TLD. The other issue that uh, certainly helped us to transition to TLD from a policy perspective was the savings that we were able to uh, project in the movement from TE to TLD. Of course, over time, the, the, the prices have come much closer, but when we took the decision early in late in 2018, early 2019, uh, we had projected quite a significant amount of savings, which we then used to also get uh, our politicians to agree to, uh, to switching. You know, one of the issues that uh, uh, some of the politicians who are doctors, medical doctors asked was, you know, patients are doing well on TE, why do you want to switch them uh, to another drug and, you know, complicate our treatment regimen? And one of the arguments we had used is, is the issue of cost, better drug, less side effects, notwithstanding and neural tube defects, et cetera. So I think we're quite confident, uh, even sitting outside the department now, that we will rapidly uh, move to a fairly full-scale transition uh, for most patients uh, uh, that currently are on TE to TLD. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Jürgen. Uh, a lot of success indeed in this transition. Um, now, um, colleagues, if you, if you have questions to the panelists, please don't hesitate to, to, uh, to put them in the chat. And as the all panelists are doing quite well on timing, I hope that we'll have you an opportunity to take one or two. But now is the time for our COVID-19 round of questions. In March, the MPP board expanded the mandate of uh, the medicines patent pool to cover COVID-19 treatments and technologies. What is clear amongst all global he health actors is that we have a lot of experience in the fight against infectious diseases and to be effective in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic, we will need to ensure that resources are used effectively and also to avoid duplication. There are a number of initiatives for equitable access, including in particular the access to COVID-19 tools, ACT Accelerated, also known as ACTA, which is a global collaboration of organizations and governments working to accelerate the development, production, and equitable access of new COVID-19 technologies, drug, diagnostics, vaccine. Uh, the second one that I would like to mention is called the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, or CTAP, which is an initiative led by the WHO and the president of Costa Rica to provide a one-stop shop for scientific knowledge, data, and IP to be shared equitably. And in addition, governments are also looking into different initiatives. For each of your perspectives and your diverse positions, what would we take from the HIV experience in the fight against COVID-19? And how can we ensure equitable access? I will start again with Nelson Otwama. Nelson, what is the role of communities in the COVID-19 response? And what key messages should, should be heard? Thank you very much once again, Chair, and I'm happy to contribute to the point on COVID-15. Uh, we, we need just to remind the global community that this pandemic is in human beings, and uh, human beings are the people and they are the communities. So they, their role is, first of all, to accept that this is something that is in their reality and educate uh, families and even uh, people who have other conditions uh, on, on, on COVID. And uh, raise awareness on it and also advocate so that the global community knows that uh, this is a pandemic that is also existing among other epidemics so that we don't forget what we were doing, but we forge forward and make sure that we as communities and even civil society, we are prepared to move this forward. Uh, we, this pandemic came and everybody was threatened and fearful and was scared. And what is important is that we normalize this as a long-term issue that we need to deal with and accept that it is in the world and stop the stigma around it and also approach it 
from public health, but also from the human rights perspective, so that those who are exposed to COVID or those who have relatives who have COVID also see that this, these are human beings who are sick and who need medical care and medical attention, and then can go out to be tested to create demand for its management, because right now we don't have a cure, but we have ways of uh, treating uh, the symptoms that come in, including pneumonia that, that COVID bring in. The other role is to remind countries that this can be approached through the wider universal health coverage approach, and which means countries must invest in health. And uh, because it is disrupting health systems, there will need to be approach of investment, whether from global fund, PEFA, or other partners, or even countries, to strengthen health systems so that communities can also go to those facilities and get support when they have COVID. And uh, the other role for uh, communities is to make sure that they link with agencies so that they get knowledge around it. Most people are still not educated around COVID. Some people say it is contagious. Some people say you get it from semen. Some people think that yeah, you, if you just move near, it's airborne. And therefore, communities need to educate and learn and even go further and educate their colleagues on what really do we need to stop this COVID. And uh, lastly, and more importantly, communities need to live with the measures put in place to slow down the spread of the virus, which is uh, social distancing and washing, sanitizing, and making sure that they don't crowd. And uh, when they see any suspect who could be having fever, they refer to facilities. Thank you very much to be part of this webinar. Thanks, uh, Nelson. Carmen, no. Carmen, as a co-convener of the Act A for Therapeutics, what are Unitaid's view on access to treatment and what needs to be considered upfront as new treatments and technologies become available? Thank you for a very relevant and timely question indeed. So I was thinking that access to effective tools for COVID, whether it's the supportive tools, the diagnostics treatments, we can all clearly leverage lessons from our previous work in improving the management of other global diseases such as HIV. But in medicines to prevent or treat COVID-19, no doubt, however, that additional complexities are present, such as the potential immediate shortages, especially in countries with less leverage, with less purchasing power, if left without support. And of course, the urgency to accelerate access, as you were mentioning, while still evidence is being collected for those products. So in the therapeutics pillar within the ACT accelerator that uh, UNITAID is co-leading, we are trying to plan ahead, anticipating the potential positive reach outs of the clinical trials that are ongoing. We are looking into the market situation of the different candidates to understand precisely, as per your question, what can be done upfront what bottlenecks we will eventually face if a given candidate becomes recommended for COVID? Will there be enough production capacity or is there the need to actually invest in additional capacity to meet all estimated needs for that product? If already in use for other indications, in addition, such as hepatitis or HIV or malaria, those needs also need to be taken into account. And also very importantly, we need to question whether the price will be hindering access, whether the market current price, if it's a repurposed product, or a declared price, if it's a new entity, a new chemical entity. And of course, we have to ask ourselves and analyze if the intellectual property situation will eventually be limiting the expansion of production capacity if it's needed, or price decrease and thinking what can be done about this, what kind of interventions are better suited in each case against each of these problem, potential problems, which ones can start now so that we can get ready, even if we have almost yet no product that have shown efficacy and safety, as you know. And I want to highlight that the situation is actually going to be very different, and hence the interventions we need to plan to overcome potential problems. If we are talking about an old repurposed cheap product becoming recommended, as dexamethasone now, or if we need instead supplies of a novel treatment product not yet established in the market. If it is a small molecule or a more complex one, such as the biologics, which I really want to highlight, for example, the monoclonal antibodies for which generic markets, biosimilars, are yet so 
immature. So a lot of challenges ahead and a lot of questions, but we clearly know that we need to start preparing in advance ahead of time because the urgency of the response is really there. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. Helen, how is VIV Healthcare engaging at present in the COVID-19 response? Thanks, Mary Paul. So uh, the main, we, we're um, contributing in two, um, two areas. The first being really to contribute our science and innovation and really looking at whether any of our medicines, either marketed products or those in our R&D pipeline, could have some utility in the response to COVID. Um, and, and that we hope to hear um, to get some results soon. We're also working, um, of course, being 100% focused on HIV, we are extremely concerned about the potential of the impact of COVID-19 on people living with HIV around the world. And so we're working very closely with the community and with researchers to really help to sort of better understand um, the intersection and the impact of COVID on people living with HIV and to try and help play a part in reducing that impact on their services uh, and care delivery. And um, so we've had um, the, an emergency response fund for COVID, um, which gave 33 million pounds in grants out, actually there's a press release out today, um, which will explain the, the various areas of research that we are looking to support there. Of course, we also support um, through our majority shareholder, GSK, who is in space working collaboratively with other um, research institutes and other big uh, factors um, to try and be part. We all know this is going to take more than one, um, but we're working very closely with them to share our understanding and what we've learned from access to medicines for HIV to make sure that there can be you know benefits and, and learning points from that to support any solutions that could come through from our shareholders as well. Thank you. Thanks. Helen. Uh, Anil, at Milan, what role do you see yourself playing in the coming years on COVID-19? Sure. Well, I want to um, just come back to some points that Nelson made. I I'm so glad that we've had colleagues here from South Africa, from Kenya, from Malawi, because they always remind us about the needs of communities uh, in country. And I think that while there's a lot to do in terms of making COVID-19 therapeutics available, and I'll speak to that in one moment. It's critical that we acknowledge the, the, the role all of us could play to maintain continuity of care for existing healthcare needs, um, because if uh, those fall short, then we have a compounding crises, uh, and we could potentially have more people dying or at risk of other diseases than COVID because of COVID but nonetheless um, uh, actually at risk of these other diseases. So relative to that need that Nelson so rightly mentioned, part of what Mylan is doing is ensuring that our core business, which is R&D manufacturing and distribution of thousands of medicines, including medicines that are needed in ICUs, including medicines for HIV and hepatitis, that we're still doing that work. Half of our workforce, tens of thousands of people are in India and they have to go to their manufacturing facilities in order for those medicines to be produced. So all of us working together, not just focused on the next therapeutics, but on asking ourselves, how can we work together to maintain that continuity of, of R&D manufacturing, distribution, and healthcare delivery uh, is critical. So for us, that's uh, keeping our core business running, keeping our facilities running, which thankfully we've been able to do, and also adapting the medicines we already make to the world as it exists with COVID. So, and, and just a very easy and specific example of that is how the Global Fund and PEPFAR and others, of course, in country national governments have asked that manufacturers move our products to three and six month packs so that patients don't have to go back and forth to a healthcare facility, <clears throat> which in the context of COVID has become more difficult. So that's the first answer to the question. As far as new therapeutics, what I'd say to that is, not only do we need to learn our lessons or, or build from HIV, we need to do a lot better. As I mentioned earlier, four years in the case of HCV and HIV, from originator approval to low cost generic, 
that is not acceptable in the case of COVID. And so we really need to ask how can we go much, much more quickly? And that involves taking risk that we would otherwise not take. So in the case of remdesivir, Gilead has provided licenses even before it received its uh, stringent regulatory authority approval. Um, those licensees are now supplying the product. So that means risk on, the ha on behalf of the originator, also on behalf of the generic manufacturers, we also have to acknowledge that a lot of the demand is unknown. So unlike the TLD volume guarantee for dolutegravir, we don't know what the demand is going to be for these therapeutics. And that creates an opportunity, I think, with the international community to say, how can we de-risk some of that uncertainty? So if we don't know the demand, we can still gear up to make sure that we can supply these products if the demand goes there, because it's going to move more quickly than we can scale up manufacturing but how do, we, how do we assess, quantify that risk and de-risk together? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Anil. Nadala, uh, from the Ministry of Health of Malawi. What consideration should be given to low-income countries in order to ensure access to COVID-19 treatments and technologies? Thank you, Mary Paul. Um, I think before we look at the considerations we can, we can give for these countries like Malawi, we need to look at how HIV started and take and borrow a leaf from there. When HIV started, there was a lot of stigma surrounding the disease and as a result, people were not presenting to health facilities to access treatment. And we're starting to see the same here in Malawi where those who have mild symptoms of COVID-19 are not presenting to health facilities because of the stigma issue. So I think before we can look at that, we need to see how we can use the HIV experience to, dist to destigmatize COVID-19 so that we can encourage access to care. And I think for a country like Malawi, we are having issues with increased demand for testing whereas our output is very low at the moment. And as you know, real-time PCR is very labor intensive and it's a specialized tool. So as Malawi, I believe that what we need is to increase access to uh, cheap point of care testing. I know that it's currently not available, but that's, those are the things that, uh, those are the technologies that Malawi needs in order to help with the fight against COVID-19. And from what we've also learned from a supply chain perspective, as people are trying to donate to the country, which is very welcome, we have noticed that there's a push to try and use parallel supply chain systems. Whereas what we're looking at right now is strengthening the current supply chain systems and using the national storage and distribution capacity and distributing to the last mile. Because I think we've had uh, problems with distributing to only district level where we have 28 districts in, in Malawi we have had issues of don donations coming only to the district level. Therefore, this is discouraging access for all the, for all the products for COVID-19, as well as for personal protective wear for the healthcare uh, workers in, all, in our clinics. And lastly, I think for us to be able to manage our supplies and to be able to increase access at all health facilities, we are trying to use mobile applications which, are, which will allow us to report the stock status at health facility level so that we can be able to reach out to all healthcare facilities and then be able to resupply at a timely, uh, resupply timely to all healthcare facilities. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tadala. No, Jürgen. Yeah, what's, what's the position of South Africa at present, given the concerns in the increase in cases of COVID-19 of late? And, and how has CHAI been preparing for that? So uh, CHAI has been supporting the Department of Health in both participating in uh, a number of work streams, as well as the incident management team uh, of the department. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I wish to... Uh, suggest a few things, uh, Mary Paul, if I may. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, the rate of testing is not as high as we would like to see it, largely because of the lack of test kits and reagents. Uh, you know, the, the, I think the Global South in particular has suffered uh, from uh, not having sufficient access uh, to test kits and reagents. So what we would like to call for is, you know, greater equity in the access uh, to test kits. And I know there's a global scramble for them, but if you, know, if you don't test, you don't know. 
uh, we are also moving to looking at uh, serological tests and antibody tests uh, for, for surveillance. And again, you know, that's an area that we would like to see uh, growing. Uh, on the issue of uh, medicines and vaccine, I mean, I fully agree with Anil, and Anil's point is well taken that four years is way too long. But there are two other issues I'd like to add, and that is that we'll have to move, I think, far more to local manufacture. And in the context of vaccines, we have to take seriously the call for, the, for a people's vaccine. And I guess the same should be said about medicines, Anil, that we should have people's medicines. Uh, and that speaks to both equity and access as well as affordability and quality. Um, and the one other thing I'd like to add, uh, Mary Paul, is around the intersection between HIV and COVID. A study done in the Western Cape province has shown that people with HIV are about 2.3 times more likely to die from COVID. Uh, and about 50% of, of them also have comorbidities, either uh, sorry, either diabetes or hypertension. So we have to start looking at people as, as people and not just people with a disease, you know, whether it's COVID infection or HIV or diabetes or hypertension. And we have to look at a more integrated approach to and more, uh, you know, more patient or a person-centered approach uh, to deal with it. And I think COVID has yet again showed us that we've got to think about multimorbidities. Um, and I think I would like to encourage both the generic manufacturers and other manufacturers together with the MPP and Unitape to take a far more multimorbidity uh, approach uh, to dealing with, uh, with people with many conditions. Um, and, you, you know, uh, the key I think is we've been looking for magic bullets. And I think we have also taken our foot off the prevention angle. And we've been talking about, you know, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, all the things we know we need, we need to do. Uh, and I think, again, I think as my colleague from uh, Malawi has said, as well as Nelson, that we've got to mobilize society and make this a societal issue rather than just a medical issue uh, to deal with, you know, with magic bullets. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, indeed, uh, um, Jürgen. I think that looking for a magic, magic bullet will, will not work. And, and the COVID-19 fight has to be won with the communities, with the people, and not uh, with them as passengers or spectators. There's no doubt about that. So let's hope that this is where we're going we're gonna to go. Now, finally, on COVID-19, uh, Esteban, MPP has been engaging with different players on a potential COVID-19 uh, intellectual property pool. Uh, can you tell us a little where MPP stands today and what role this pool could play? Sure, thank you, Mary Paul. So as you mentioned, uh, when we started off uh, this, this webinar, um, back in March 30th, our, our board temporarily expanded our mandate uh, to work on COVID-19 technologies for which licensing could contribute to innovation and or access. So the idea really is um, if there are health-related technologies um, for in the fight for COVID-19, where licensing can contribute, can make a difference, can add, for example, manufacturing capacity, or can uh, address gaps, uh, whether on the innovation side or on the access side, that is really where the MPP through its experience and expertise over the past 10 years could bring something to the table. And that's very much been in response to a lot of stakeholders making for that call. So we, we, we took that on early on as, as a commitment. And at the moment, there is a lot of discussion going on and a lot of uh, uh, details being worked out together with our, with, 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 with our colleagues at the ACT Accelerator, um, who are doing a really interesting work on market preparedness on how do we prepare in the event that we do get those drugs that can really make a difference, um, but having to prepare for it now. And that's where I really want to echo the words of, of Anil, uh, Anil Sony earlier on. Um, the the four-year gap won't work. We need to condense all of that. And what are all the different things that need to be happen along the chain to condense that? Uh, and even if we do condense it, and we've managed to bring it down to six months or whatever it may be, or a year, how, how is access going to happen in that interim? Because the crisis is now, um, and, and it's very difficult to project ourselves today, where is the epidemiology going to be six months, a year from now? 
So we really need to be looking at all the pieces of it where licensing can be one component and potentially a really important one, um, both in relation to, to, to medicines and potentially also um, uh, vaccines. Um, but doing the things in parallel, how do we do that? We're probably going to need technology transfer quite significantly along with the licenses to accelerate. Um, how are we going to deal with the regulatory issues? Is that going to become another bottleneck? Or is that going to be something that's going to delay access? Of course, the regulatory and quality assurance is essential. Um, but how do we do that while maintaining high quality products? Um, and, and I think those are other questions that are being asked right now. And, 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 and I think through partnerships at the Act Accelerator and the uh, and the uh, uh, CTAP, the WHO is leading on the, the, the COVID technology access pool, um, is trying to address many of these uh, complementary issues. And I think the MPP is, 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 is a player that's going to be uh, working with those various initiatives to, um, to, to, to where licensing is important, offer our expertise and make that available. So hopefully it's a lot, uh, the, you know, it's early days and we still don't know uh, because we're still waiting to see the data on many of the products, but there may be significant uh, opportunities um, down the line. The last point I do want to make is that in the meantime, we do have to remain very vigilant on how COVID-19 is affecting our core work of the MPP in relation to the HIV, hepatitis C and TB epidemics. And I do want to reassure all the partners we've been working with, and in particular, the communities of people living with HIV, that that continues to be an essential uh, activity of the MPP and anything we're trying to do uh, on COVID will not distract us from that core mission and that core commitment we have to the communities. Thank you very much, Mary Paul. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Esteban. Indeed, uh, uh, the MPP remains committed, uh, as we were always, to the people living with, with HIV, to, to also with people with tuberculosis or, or hepatitis C, in spite of the COVID crisis. Now, um, I, I, I've been told that we have received a few questions, but we have also unfortunately run out of time to discuss further. Therefore, I would like to thank each of our panelists today for sharing the story of access to antiretrovirals from their perspective. Indeed, we have come a long way together in increasing access to affordable quality of HIV treatments. But there are still things to be done. Uh, whether it is in terms of bringing pediatric formulation or moving towards long-acting version of these medicines so people don't miss doses and stigma can be thought. In short, the fight continues. Now, Virtual AIDS 2020 starts next week. MPP has a virtual booth. I didn't even know that this existed. So I invite you to go and visit and ask your questions there. MPP, together with UNITAIDS and WHO, will be holding a satellite session on July 7 at IAS on the work of long acting. And we will close this session, this webinar, on a video, the trailer for Ukraine Impact Channel. Here you will find a number of interesting interviews and stories from a range of MPP partners that you will also see on our website. Thank you for your participation and to all of you for who's been who've been watching this webinar. Goodbye. My name is Anton Basenko, I'm from Kiev, Ukraine. I started to use heroin. As I uh, usually say, that was my opioid trap. So my first uh, thought was, okay, how many years uh, I, I can still live?
И я очень надеюсь, что Украина будет включена в медицинский отдел международного патентного пула для того, чтобы мы получили новые схемы лечения, пангенотипические, например, как пибрентосвир, лекопривир, для лечения таких сложных больных перелечивания. И это расширит не только доступ к терапии, а это, естественно, чем больше больных будет отвечать на ту или иную схему лечения, тем меньше вероятность распространения этого заболевания в популяции. Естественно, а гепатит ЖЦ признан на сегодняшний день самым смертоносным вирусом. to do is get affordable access of quality drugs to the people who need them. That's what, that's the whole aim of it. To make our model work, we absolutely have to work very closely with a whole range of, of partners.